Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, the Moorhead Observatory. So this is the mighty Moorhead Telescope. Uh, it's a 24-inch telescope, so down at the bottom here, the primary mirror is about two feet in diameter. You can't really see it because it has the jacket on the outside, right, to keep out the stray light. Uh, but inside, it's essentially like that prop telescope uh, that I showed you some pictures of downstairs. So primary mirror's in the bottom, light comes from the sky, bounces off that primary, bounces off a secondary, and then comes through the hole in the donut to this box back here. And inside of this box, I could switch back and forth between using an eyepiece or using the camera. There's actually no camera here right now. The camera is currently broken. We sent it out for repair. It's going to come back, but right now I don't really have a camera attached to that. Here, so it's just kind of open. But that's okay. So if I were going to take some observations right now, can I do that? I mean, ignoring the camera problem. No, why can't I do that? The dome is closed. The dome is closed, right? I need to be able to see the sky. So why don't we go ahead and open up the dome? Besides, I'll make it brighter. So ignoring the clouds, now we have the dome open. We can finally take some observations. Uh, so that's good. So now that we get a better look at it, uh, here is the beauty and majesty that it is the Moorhead Telescope. Uh, it was built in the early 70s, so it has that kind of, I'm going to be generous and call it a vintage look to it. Uh, when it was first built, the way we moved it around, we have this uh, this can paddle here. It's like a really, really boring video game. You can hold a button and move it around. Uh, if you want to know where you are, right, we have these coordinates on the sky, right ascension and definition. But we happen to have a set of dials here in the front of the telescope, so you could read out the right ascension definition. So I knew there was a particular object I wanted to see, I could see there was a hand paddle, read files, and get it there. That's really boring after about 30 seconds, thousand um, years on. So we eventually updated, and so in the 90s, we uh, went all the way to a DOS based computer. So uh, we had this nice green screen over here on the left, uh, but it was an interface that we could talk to the telescope with. So now I can go there, I can type in coordinates, and I can get it to go somewhere. That was a lot better than the hand paddle. Still not where we would be. So, in uh, about 2005 or so, we skyrocketed all the way to the cutting edge technology of Windows XP. And that's the machine over here on the right. And now we actually have a point and click interface where we can tell where we want to go. Uh, now, due to some, you know, cantankerous nature of some of the hardware, what actually occurs is that this computer talks to that computer, and that computer talks to itself. But it's a system that works pretty well. So, uh, for the next thing we're going to do here, I'm going to need a volunteer, and I need a volunteer with a laptop. So, who wants to volunteer? Who's that? Anybody there? Maybe. Got one Alright, we got a laptop. Fantastic. I want you to go to the Skynet webpage for me and log in if you haven't already. Okay. <coughs> All right, let me know when you're logged in there. Okay, fantastic. I would like you to go and add an observation. And so in this case, uh, I want you to search for an object, and the object I want you to search for is M81. So the letter M and the number 81. <laughs> look that up. And select the open filter and hit next. And now you have a series of telescopes to choose from. You never guess which one you choose. So you've chosen more than the next. Okay, so uh, then I want you to take one exposure of about two seconds. It doesn't have to be exactly two seconds, but you know, right around there. So she has put an observation into the system. The telescope is automatically moving to get there. Oh, I'm So you see what I said about the Delta Rotating very slowly? This is 
why we can't really afford to use a split belt down in here. Like, the telescope is already there. The telescope is ready to go. It's just waiting on the belt. I move one more time, don't worry about it. Let's just settle down. Oh, dang! I think you should reload the bike. <laughs> Alright, if you reload the page, you find your observation is now complete. Okay, so click on M81 and go look at that observation. Bring up the JPEG. Okay, Let me see that. I don't know. I'll show it to you. All right, here we go. Behold the majesty of M81. The most wondrous picture you've ever seen. The exquisite detail. Okay, it's just a black rectangle, right? So why is it a black rectangle? Why can we not see M81? I can think of three reasons. It's daytime, reason number one. It's cloudy, reason number two. Do I have a camera? <laughs> ah, yeah, I remember. I told you about that. We took the camera off, right? So right now we're connected to what's called camera singular. It's pretending to take a picture. So the picture that comes back isn't real. So why did I go through all that? Why did I go off? Well, this was the illustrative point, right? When you put an observation into the system, you're not just lobbing it off into the ether into some black hole and something comes back from somewhere. When you put an observation into the system, some physical piece of hardware somewhere in the world is going to respond to that. And you're going to reach across the world, 4,000 miles away, the other side of the planet, and you're going to bend that telescope to your view. If you don't think that's cool, you're not really thinking about it hard enough. <laughs> but there's always a physical thing that you are actually moving. So, with that in mind, who else would like to move the telescope? All of you, that's great. <laughs> so everybody got your laptops. And now we're going to subdivide further into two groups. So, everybody on this side of the room, I want you to put in observations of M81. And everybody on this side of the room, I want you to put in observations of M44. So, M44. You guys, M81. You're welcome to put a second one in if you'd like another black rectangle. Yeah, use the open filter and choose more. Yes, please. All right, Jay Osad, that was yours. You know just happened? <laughs> All right, whose username is Rock Sane? This is yours, buddy. going to, yeah, uh, so here's what's just happened. Someone who is not one of you guys has put an observation on the telescope just now. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. We're just going to go ahead and cancel their observation because <laughs> I can do that. Unfortunately, the system doesn't know I've done that, so take it all the way over there. Realize this is the ticket and then move back. <laughs> now we're going to go back to you guys. 
So each and every time you guys put an observation in a physical telescope or room. By the way, how many other classes have you had to take in before you guys move to the room? Anybody? You're taking three other classes you can move to Always one in every class. All right, that was uh, Constans. Constans, anybody? That, that was you. You just went in. That was Ann Leonard. DM Sierra is you. RM Howell. That's you. So that's funny. We're getting everybody on one half, one half of the room. None of you have anything. That's kind of awesome. And winner. That was you. All right, now we're moving. Now we seem to be headed over to the area of the So that's kind of weird. Was it just a coincidence that everybody on this half of the room got in first? In fact, I actually told you guys you were out there first, so you guys should have done it. Well, something interesting has happened here. So, whenever you put observations in the system, you are not the only person using the system. I can illustrate that just a second ago. I've got an observation from not one of you guys. So, we have to break ties somehow. And there are two basic mechanisms by which we break ties. One is that priority level, right? So you guys have access to priority level five. I have access to priority level one, so I can trump all of your observations at once. Now I'm not going to do that because I'm on the spot. You guys are at priority level five, so that's one way to do this. But wait a minute, there are like 300 other people at priority level five who are all putting observations at the same time. So how are we going to break ties? There are a couple ways we can do it. We can go with the dibs system, you know, the first one to say dibs gets it, the first one in wins. We could do that, but that's not what we actually do. We've instead chosen to go, go another way, and that way is to go with whatever object is higher on the sky wins. Why would we do that? Why is higher on the sky like? Oh, sorry? Well, not necessarily. It's low on the sky if you can set it. Sorry? Less movement? Possibly? So the real issue, I'm going to actually answer my own question by asking you a different question. Why are sunsets red? The atmosphere is scattering the light. As the sun gets lower and lower on the, on the sky, so it's closer to the horizon, it's going through more atmosphere than if it were higher in the sky. Right? So the lower an object gets on the sky, the more its light is going to get scattered. So I get worse images low on the sky than I get high on the sky. So all other things being equal, we choose the one that's going to give us the best image. So we choose the guys who are higher on the sky first. And since uh, M44 was higher than M81, we went and did all of the M44 jobs because they were all essentially high with everybody, except for height. And then we went and did all of the energy jobs. Okay? Make sense? So now you see why the system is kind of set up in a strange way it is. And now you believe that when you put an observation in, something's going to move. And is that not cool? Fantastic. So, any questions? All right.